SCP-8140 Burial Goods A common saying is that history is written by the victors, meaning that the details of any sort of historical conflict are generally presented by the side that won the conflict. While we would like all of our history to be completely and empirically true, the fact remains that much of human history is tainted in some way by perspective and bias. If we could somehow go back and view these events as they happened, it would likely broaden our understanding of history and human development in immeasurable ways. SCP-8140 is an anomaly about looking back to the past, to a very specific event as well as trying to rewrite history to better suit our purposes. Let's take a look. The article begins with a picture of SCP-8140-1, a crude sword made from petrified wood and dated around 9000 BCE. In an internal affairs post-incident debriefing from 2004, a person being interviewed is asked why something happened to which they respond that they couldn't live with what happened, and they had to change it. The interviewer asks when did they let this feeling interfere with the project, to which the person says that they've read the file, so they know how it started. With that, we're given the description for 8140, a collection of anomalous artifacts unearthed from an archaeological site outside of the ruins of Gobekli Tepe, a settlement which was abandoned around 8140 BCE, located in the southeastern region of Anatolia, in Turkey. These artifacts exhibit a retroactive empirical ontological effect, and when an individual handles one of the artifacts for the first time, they experience a lifelike hallucination, consisting of the experiences of the artifact's original owner. The period of time these experiences cover varies wildly, with some having memories from only a few moments, while others contain years of information. Throughout the duration of the hallucination, the individual experiences the memories as if they are the originating entity, which includes them experiencing the events of a memory through the eyes of a subject, but without complete disassociation, as the observing individual is always aware of their own identity. While the individual experiencing the hallucination experiences them as they occurred, the objective amount of time takes around less than a minute. This transition from experiencing the memories and coming back to reality can lead to some side effects, including delirium, fatigue, agitation, slowed cognition, limited aphasia, prospagnosia, and derealization. These effects last several minutes, although the memories seem to exhibit significant nestic properties, with amnestic treatments having been entirely unsuccessful at erasing the memories. Each artifact found also emits low levels of Akiva radiation, which has created a baseline for identification. The artifacts exhibit cultural identifiers of the early Davite civilization, and another unknown culture, dated to around 9000 BCE, and originate in a lair previously undiscovered in a nearby field outside of Gobekli Tepe. Previously, that site had yielded no anomalous artifacts, but a routine archaeological excavation in November of 2004 revealed a new lair. The anomalous effect of the artifacts was first discovered upon the unearthing of 8140-1, when a graduate student experienced what was described as a psychotic break after handling it. Embedded Foundation agents within the Turkish Ministry of Health reported their symptoms, leading to the Foundation locking down the site under a cover story of methane deposits. The graduate student was subsequently interviewed, with amnestics proving to be entirely unreliable, so the student was instead recruited onto the 8140 project to assist senior researcher Niels Lindqvist. We're given an excerpt of a conversation from the Site 91 Med Center taken on October 2nd, 2003, in which a person with a head wound appears to be extremely agitated, asking where someone is. We're then given a couple of entries taken from Dr. Lindqvist's private research log from November 14th and 15th, 2004. They read, November 14th, 2004. 
Malcolm has found the adjustment to life beyond the veil hard, but his options were limited. Without the effect of amnestics, the Foundation couldn't let him wander free knowing what he did. I guess the other option would have been to have him committed at home back in the UK, but given his first-hand experience with the site and his discovery of the anomaly, it seemed more productive to give him a job. After all, I was recruited in much the same way. SCP-8140-1 is bizarre. Ostensibly, it resembles a sword from the Iron Age, but it dates to the late Paleolithic and is entirely shaped from pieces of petrified wood, which would be millions of years old. I say shaped because it does not seem to have been constructed in traditional ways, but coaxed to grow into this shape. The pommel is larger than an ordinary human hand could easily manage, and even in its damaged state it weighs nearly 30 kilograms, which would be far too heavy to wield. Strangest of all, the edges, although worn through time and pressure, are still sharp enough to cut skin. When Malcolm was packing it away, using reinforced containment gloves, he slipped and the edge cut through the glove and into his palm. A sword made from petrified wood countless centuries old cut through gloves that can resist hundreds of pounds of pressure and radiation and into a man's skin. Even without the memory transfer, it would be a startling anomaly. Malcolm's description of the anomalous memories leaves a lot to be desired. He's mostly confused by the experience. I have him leading the excavation team to survey the area for any other hotspots of Akiva. I've decided to experience the memory transfer myself. November 15, 2004 it's not like anything I could have imagined. I was it. It was me. Don't get me wrong, I could remember my own life. I was not delusional. But in that moment, I felt everything he... it... felt. Okay, first things first. Description. I'm estimating that he was nearly three meters tall from the vantage of the battle. Incredibly strong. Strong enough to hold that sword and he could swing it. Oh, could he swing it? This was the site of a major military action. Thousands of combatants fighting with stone axes, spears, and more of the thing like me, or the thing I was. It's confusing. The side effects wore off fast, but the memories, they're not going anywhere. I could smell myself, itself, himself, whatever, wet skin and fur, like a goddamn werewolf, but not, definitely still a primate, but huge. He, I, was fighting with two others like me, against these little goblin-like creatures, humanoid, but made from mud and grass and blood. I don't know. What they were didn't matter, because they were following a general, or commander. A woman in flowing robes of crimson, golden headdress, spear made from volcanic glass, and her eyes... Her eyes were on fire. Not literally, mind you, just glowing with such anger, like, how dare we attack her? Such disdain. I couldn't understand anything she was saying, but I knew we were against her, and she was against us. I, he, it, must have killed dozens of these small humanoid entities, but when we got close to the woman in charge, she cut her palm and flung the blood at us, the droplets ripping towards us like a cannon, and then blackness. I need to speak with Director Varga. We need some way to record these experiences. I've heard of a device that can record someone's dreams. Maybe that could work. It's hard to speak to every detail, so if we could record them, it would better help us better understand. Pretty sure the woman I saw... 
was a deva. This could be what I've been waiting for. The only reason to come back to work was this. Nothing else matters. There was another conversation on October 2nd, 2003, presumably with the person with the head wound, but now speaking to the director of Site 91. It's still not clear how this is connected to 8140, but the person blames the site director for what happened, while the director tells them that they need counseling, as they're not functioning currently and they need them to function. The person says that they'd give anything to take that last day back and to get her out of the site. Numerous other instances of 8140 artifacts were unearthed within a week of the first one and given the high potential for research purposes, Dr. Lindqvist was issued an approval for usage of a prototypical oneirosensory visualization recording device to record the memories. We're provided with an excerpt from the testing log, looking at 8140-5, stone arrowheads carved with Davite runes. The memories begin with a feminine arm, decorated in gold and topaz bangles, inscribing a Davite rune on the forehead of a humanoid figure, seemingly formed entirely of mud, blood, and grass. After the rune is finished, this golem awakens, and the arms of a Davite priestess help it to its feet, at which point it shuffles over to another woman standing near a wooden rack filled with weapons. This woman is dressed in red robes, with a breastplate made of lacquered wood slats overlaid with gold and precious stones. A long stone ceremonial double-edged dagger hangs from her belt, and she holds out a bow and arrow. The golem promptly takes them and walks outside of the room. The subject walks to a first-story window overlooking a garden where another Davite priestess can be seen gathering the golems into two platoons of approximately 40 entities. The other priestess in the room asks the subject how things are progressing, speaking in ancient Davite, but the words are automatically translated. The subject replies that things are going as well as can be expected, given that she is the only one gifted enough to make the constructs. Progress is slow, so they should wait for reinforcements from Aditum, suggesting that this memory takes place before the Sarkic revolution that was centered around that city. The priestess responds that they don't have the time, as they will be here soon. The woman replies that she at least will have a chance to see one of their tree warriors, as she's always wanted one for herself. The priestess says that today, however, they need to create more grass children to bolster their ranks, as the conscripts they have here will not hold off the nightkin alone. The priestess then asks why she and her sister general precluded the use of the ritual, to which she replies that it is not ready, and while her sister works towards the culmination, it cannot yet be relied upon. The priestess asks if it could have saved them, to which she replies that Maybe it could have, but they will have to rely on each other and the conscripts. The font will lend them her life-affirming vigor for the strength to push back the barbarians. The priestess responds that the font provides, but as the woman begins to shape another golem out of clay, grass, and blood, she whispers to herself, asking if that will be enough. In the Site-91 psychologist's office on October 21st, 2003, the person decides that they don't actually blame Varga, the site director, for what happened. It was just easier to blame her than to face up to the reality that they blame themselves. They weren't even supposed to be at the site that day, they just needed to pick something up from their quarters, and if they hadn't forgotten it, maybe things would have been different. Once testing with 8140 began, Dr. Lindqvist requested access to SCP-140, the Chronicle of the Devas, to compare the memories against the only historical record of the Davite people. Access was granted, under guard, and Lindqvist came to a couple of conclusions. One is that SCP-140 did have references to the battle in that area around that time period and this information was not previously on record within SCP-140. The book had previously been fairly vague on the history of the early Empire, 
but this new information had manifested recently, although the cause for this change is unknown. We're then given a brief recap of SCP-140 and its effects, and how the Deva viewed time as being fairly malleable. SCP-140 will alter reality to match its events, and this retro-causal thaumaturgic ritual is the anomaly most intrinsically bound with the survival of their culture. It's this ritual that Lindqvist believes the Davites in the memories were attempting to achieve. In another memory, taken from 8140-8, a shield made from petrified wood, the subject stands at least two meters off the ground in an area similar to that of the archaeological site. Several large primate entities covered in fur stand around them, and the subject raises a wooden spear to point towards a temple complex and surrounding village, theorized to be Gobekli Tepe at the height of its occupation. The subject says something, although this is not automatically translated, and doesn't match up to any known language within the Foundation's databases. One of the other entities turns to the trees and makes a call, at which point the trees begin to move and stretch until they resemble roughly humanoid shapes, with eight of these tree entities responding to the call. Lindqvist comments that those remind him of SCP-3140, entities believed to be created by the Davites, but here it seems that they didn't originate with them. The subject raises their shield and pounds their spear against it, as a group of figures in the distance can be seen running towards them. Several more primates fall in with the subject and begin advancing along with the arboreal entities. More than 40 of the primates and another dozen arboreal entities charge towards the village and temple, and the opposing figures are revealed to be approximately 80 of the humanoid golems seen previously, wielding stone weapons. The two parties smash together in a melee, with the primates and trees overpowering the grass golems after several minutes, but suffering several casualties in the process. The memories end when the subject is hit with several arrows in the neck and chest, collapsing into the dirt. In another excerpt from Lindqvist's private research log, he writes, Each new vision is filled with more and more violence. I will spare the file from too many repetitious records. Hard to say what the motivations of the primate entities are, as we cannot discern their speech from the recordings. They organize strategically and use weapons, showing clear signs of sapience and culture. I'm more interested by the Deva. No one knew there was any such conflict in their history. Does that mean it hadn't happened before the most recent expansion of SCP-140? Or did the expansion reveal this heretofore unknown history? They fascinate me. Rewriting history to suit their needs. Battle lost? Change it. Bad day? Do it over. I would give anything to have that power. To change just that one day. I'm sure none of the Deva stared at their ceiling at night, wondering when the pain would stop. I don't wonder when the pain will stop. It's all that's left. If I didn't have that anymore, where would she be? It seems pretty clear now that Lindqvist is the one dealing with the trauma from 2003, and we're given another excerpt from his conversation with the Site-91 psychologist, from June of 2004. Lindqvist says that he should have been there, doing something more useful than bending over a hospital bed and weeping. The psychologist says that he can't keep raging against the universe, and he needs to reach out to friends. Lindqvist responds that, he can't see how that would help, and he can only think of one thing that would, if time worked backwards. Back in the present of 2004, Director Varga calls Lindqvist into her office to talk about SCP-8140. She's reviewed the test logs he's recorded in the last week, and has seen several things that made this meeting imperative. She asks him if he's familiar with SCP-1000 
to which he says that he is not. She's upping his clearance level for this project and gives him the file. After reading it, he states that he's at a loss for words, that there's an entire civilization of another species that somehow they've all forgotten about. He then says that he'll want to review any and all archaeological records they have from SCP-1000, but she tells him that there aren't any. They've never identified an archaeological site confirmed to be from the Children of the Night, as it seems that ancient humanity did the job too thoroughly. That's why she hopes that he can appreciate how important this site is, being the first real insight into their actions from antiquity. According to the file, however, that event took place in the Stone Age, which begs the question of how they took military action against the early Davites. Lindqvist says that it must be due to SCP-140 changing reality retrocausally, extending the influence of the Children of the Night further into the future. They don't know how SCP-140 works, and they don't know if some anomalous effect within the book seeks its own purposes or the person expanding the history follows their own mandate. All they know is the effect such expansions have, and he wouldn't be surprised if they find more archaeological data pertaining to SCP-1000 after this. He also comments on how interesting it would be to understand how SCP-140 and Davite thaumaturgy can affect causality in general, but the director shuts him down, stating that they can't go messing with the timeline, and experimenting with SCP-140 is forbidden even to the O5s. Lindqvist tells her, of course, and to forget he said anything, but in his private research log he calls them fools, and says that if they had an ounce of courage, maybe they wouldn't have to die in the dark, and maybe they could protect those people that deserved it. Back in June, in Lindqvist's personal quarters, he's speaking to someone and asks why he has to accept how it happened, because they could change it. Madness and magic are everyday occurrences, and there's a thousand ways it could work. The person tells him that he's really starting to worry them, and to please try to accept what happened, as this really isn't healthy. Lindqvist just replies that it doesn't have to be this way. On November 23rd, a day after Lindqvist's meeting with Varga, a previously undocumented subterranean chamber was discovered at the dig site. This chamber contains several Davite thaumaturgical sigils across its walls, all but one of which are imperceptible, even under the influence of Nestics. The only one remaining perceptible notably resembles those making up SCP-2140, a set of glyphs that retroactively rewrite reality to make all who view it become Davite loyalists. Nearly a dozen new instances of 8140 were found in the chamber, marking it as the highest density of the anomalous artifacts found to date. We're given the testing log for 8140-11, a breastplate with an eroded bass relief, constructed out of petrified wood. The subject in the memories is looking down at the breastplate while standing in a dwelling made from a hollowed out tree. A bed of leaves is just beyond the breastplate, next to a chair seemingly grown directly out of the tree's inner surface. The subject picks up the breastplate and begins fastening it to its chest, with it clear that the subject is an instance of SCP-1000. They move out of the dwelling, pushing aside a woven grass curtain acting as a door, and thousands of trees surround them, many of them as large as a house. From each, one or two instances of SCP-1000 emerge, and the thousands of them begin to move in a single direction. They march through the forest for several minutes, until a large, circular clearing is reached, made up of a depression in the earth nearly 100 meters wide, and several descending layers of rock outcroppings resembling an arena. At the center of the depression, a single SCP-1000 instance is standing on a dais of raised earth. The rest of the Children of the Night take seats on the stones, before the one in the middle begins to speak, with his words being translated now. It's theorized that Lindqvist's debriefing on SCP-1000 unlocked a mimetic block 
that had previously caused their speech to be unintelligible, and that without direct knowledge of their existence, not even the anomalous nature of SCP-8140 could overcome the centuries of mimetic encoding that have erased the Children of the Night from humanity's collective memory. The one in the middle welcomes his fellow Children of the Night, stating that they have not met in such numbers for many long years, as they have dwindled for centuries since the Night of the Flowers. He knows that their time is past, and they have been forced into the margins of existence on a planet they nurtured while the humans spread like wildfire. They have gathered together today, however, to discuss war, causing many of the Children of the Night to gasp and begin talking amongst themselves. The one in the middle says that he knows that they all have suffered due to the war against humanity, but to hear him out. Not far from here are a series of human city-states joining together into an empire. Their technology and ritual might are impressive, and they call themselves the Deva. They are worshippers of blood, while calling themselves guardians of life, and they enslave all cultures they encounter, sacrificing their children to gods that he cannot even imagine. The one in the middle says that they are the guardians of life on this planet, and always have been, but the humans despoil all land they touch. These humans, however, are worse, devoted to death while claiming a mantle that the children of the night were cheated of. Soon this empire will be pushing into their territory, and even now they are founding a colony centered around a temple nearby. If they weren't threatening this last stronghold of their people, he would not be making such a plea, but as it stands, this empire will be within their forest in a few years, killing their children for their disgusting rituals. He asks if they will stand by and wait for this empire to claim their birthright, and cower when the enemy is on their very threshold. The amphitheater is quiet for a few moments, until the subject from the memories stands and calls out, shouting, No. Many more individuals then stand and echo the call, and the one in the middle says to return to their homes, wake up the tree guardians, take up their weapons, and meet him at the northern edge of the forest tomorrow, where they shall march on their hive like a landslide. He tells them to march with him until every last one of the deva threatening their forest is a stain on their rock walls. Many thousands of the children of the night cheer and begin filing out of the amphitheater, and the subject whispers to himself that finally, it is war. In an internal affairs post-incident debriefing from a couple of weeks later, Lindqvist is asked when he started ignoring protocol. He replies that it was within a week of returning to duty, as he began keeping a research log with an old typewriter, and not recording it in the file. He also started cataloging the artifacts without recording them into the file, just the ones that might get him what he wanted. He's asked what he wanted, to which he states that they already know, but for the record, he wanted to change the past. One of those testing logs kept from the record but recovered later was on 8140-A1, one of the Davite sigils carved into the chamber. In the memories, the subject is carving the rock face with Davite sigils using an obsidian ritual knife, and as she finishes each one, the image of it blurs. Much of the ceiling is already blurred, indicating the presence of the anti-memetic sigils. She begins carving a new sigil beneath the most recent one, when she suddenly turns, seeing a Davite priestess cloaked in red sweeping fabric with delicate gold bangles down each arm, and a gold diadem on her head. The priestess asks her how the preparations are going, to which she simply says that they proceed, and asks if the attack has begun. It hasn't, but their scouts have identified a force of significant strength as several thousand of the apes approach the village walls. She asks how Lanessa is faring with the grass children, and the priestess says that she has made several thousand of them, so the forces will be of similar strength, and they still have the slave warriors. The subject says that they'll be fine then, and turns to continue her work. 
The priestess responds, however, that the apes are very powerful, and they have never seen them in such numbers. Each is easily the match for three or four armed men or grass children. The subject says that it is imperative, then, that she finishes, and the priestess says to excuse her candor, but asks if the ritual can do what she's promised, preserving their lives. The subject simply says that yes, it can, even reaching through the skeins of time to do so. She continues her work, now working on the sigil that is still perceptible in the modern day. In Varga's office on November 10th, she asks Lindqvist if he's ready to come back, as the psychological report has him fit for duty, but they have some concerns. Lindqvist responds by asking if she's ever lost someone like he did, to which she says that it's hard to get to this point in her career without losing some colleagues in containment breaches. She knows that's not the same as what he lost, and asks why he's coming back now. He tells her that it's cabin fever, or exhaustion, or the need to be productive again. She mentions to him an archaeological dig in Turkey, where they think some anomalous activity is happening, so it could be the sort of re-entry that will ease him back in. He says that he'll take it. The testing log for the breastplate continues, showing the memory of the subject and several other children of the night moving through the streets of a small town made up of mud and stone huts. The subject tells them to keep moving forward, as they need to secure the temple, and they proceed to ambush a group consisting of several dozen of the grass golems and several armed humans. The children of the night are joined by a group of the arboreal entities, and a melee ensues, leading to the subject taking a stone arrow to the chest, bouncing off his breastplate, and another embedding into his thigh. He ignores the wound and continues to fight, as one of his fellows is impaled on a pike, and another is killed by an approaching Davite priestess. The priestess shouts to not let them see their fear, as the font provides although the children of the night do not understand her language. The fighting continues, until only the Davite priestess and two of the children of the night remain. The subject, wounded and exhausted, approaches the wounded priestess and bats her knife aside, breaking her wrist in the process. The subject hauls her to her feet and tells her that they are better than she is, as they don't need to use slaves to fight for them. The priestess responds by calling them barbarians, and says that the font will provide, even if it does so after her death. The subject of course can't understand her words, and proceeds to snap her neck. He tells his fellow warrior that they need to proceed to the temple, as these women are up to something. The closer they get, the harder their forces fight, so they can't wait for reinforcements. Lindqvist is called into the psychologist's office a day after finding the new chamber, despite being declared fit for work. The psychologist says that this sort of trauma can be hard to shake, but Lindqvist is quite terse, stating that he's perfectly fine, and his nightmares are infrequent now, barely bothering his sleep. The psychologist asks if he's accepted what happened then, to which Lindqvist says, absolutely, as you can't change the past. From his private research log for the end of November, he writes that it has to be in this cave, whatever it is, as he'll never have a better opportunity to learn directly from the Deva. He's able to see what they saw and experience their rituals firsthand, he just hasn't found the right artifact yet, so he has to keep looking. We're then provided a transcript from the Site 91 Med Center from October 2nd, 2003 in which Lindqvist, himself pretty injured, is finally allowed to see his sister. He comments that she looks like she was in a car accident, and asks how this happened. They don't know the details, however, other than that it happened during the containment breach. She suffered significant blunt trauma and has first degree burns over 20% of her body. He needs to provide some details on her medical history, and he asks if she's going to be okay. It's too early to say, however, and they don't want to give him false hopes, as she still has some internal bleeding. 
She's breathing on her own, but they have her intubated and monitor just in case. Suddenly, however, a code blue alert sounds, and the doctor calls for a crash cart. They tell the orderly to remove Lindqvist, as he shouts for them to tell him what's happening. Back in the present, on December 1st, 2004, Lindqvist's assistant called into Site-91 expressing worry about the doctor's mental state. The assistant alleged that he hadn't slept in two days and was cataloging artifacts multiple times a day. This alerted Director Varga, as it was clear that many recordings were being intentionally omitted from reports, so security personnel were asked to secure the doctor until Varga could get on site. A video transcript then shows Lindqvist in the artifact storage chamber at the site, having just experienced a memory from a Davite urn. He swears and says no good, before two security agents enter the chamber, one holding zip ties, and both with their hands on their holstered sidearms. One of them tells Lindqvist to step away from the artifact and to put his hands behind his back, as Lindqvist shouts and asks who they are, despite both of them having been assigned to the dig site since its discovery. They tell him that the director has ordered for him to be secured until she can appraise the project, but Lindqvist insists that he doesn't know them, and doesn't have time for this. He's visibly shaking and waving his arms in an animated fashion, as he pushes past the agents. They attempt to grab his wrist, but he shoves one of the agents against the table, and the other unholsters her weapon, telling him to calm down. Lindqvist again asks who they are, before stating that they can't have his research, as he's worked too hard on this and needs it. The shoved agent extracts a baton from his belt and approaches the doctor before trying to grab him. Lindqvist scrambles out of the way and picks up the petrified wooden sword from a table nearby. The agent swings his baton towards the doctor, who brings the sword up in defense, slicing through the baton and slashing across the agent's chest, nearly severing his arm in the process. The other agent fires her gun in response, hitting him in the side. He screams and throws the sword at her, hitting her in the face with the hilt and knocking her out. Lindqvist proceeds to stagger out of the room, carrying a containment box labeled 8140-16, and he stumbles towards the entrance to the side chamber, bleeding heavily. Three hours later, Director Varga and a company of security personnel landed at the dig site, securing the site quickly. Lindqvist was found in the side chamber, his heart rate dangerously low, having lost several pints of blood. He was airlifted to secure medical facilities in Istanbul and treated, along with the unconscious agent he knocked out, but the agent he had cut succumbed to his wounds. When Lindqvist was found, he was clutching 8140-16, a knife hilt made from a human rib and carved with Davite sigils. We're given the log of the memories he experienced from it, starting with the subject carving a channel into the floor of the side chamber with the knife. The subject finishes it, joining the channel to itself in a wide circle, and she beckons a slave forward, telling him to kneel. The slave hesitates, but obeys, visibly shaking. The subject states that this sacrifice is for the lives of the Sisters of True Blood, for the defense of their temple to the Font's glory, for the continued blessings of the Font's providence, the creator of all things and spirit of life. The subject then proceeds to slash across the slave's throat, letting his blood fill the channel. She then begins murmuring to herself in an unintelligible manner before inserting the knife into the back of the slave's skull, destroying his brainstem. His movements cease as the channel fills with blood, moving circularly in a pulsating manner. The subject looks up to see the priestess from before at the entrance to the chamber, wounded and covered in dust. She falls to her knees and states that they are coming. So the subject gestures to the slaves and golems standing nearby, bidding them to go outside. The sounds of battle are soon heard afterwards, and a bestial howl echoes down the tunnel. 
A few moments later, the limping form of the Child of the Night subject from the other memories enters the chamber, bleeding from multiple wounds. He says that they are done, their people and slaves routed, and he doubts if any of her sisters live. He asks what she hopes to gain with this blood magic, but she can't understand him. Instead, she attacks him, slashing across his chest and cutting off his breastplate and cutting through his elbow, although he manages to retaliate, nearly slicing her in half. He reaches out with his good arm to finish the job, but she manages to plunge her knife into his throat with an upward swing, piercing through his jaw and into his brain. The two collapse on top of one another, their blood mingling into the channel, and the blade of the knife deteriorates and crumbles to dust. Davite sigils begin manifesting along the hilt, as if burned in, and the scene dissolves into blackness. In the analysis afterwards, it's determined that Lindqvist had been hiding significant cataloging activities from the Foundation, especially those artifacts with the Davite origin. He did this in order to learn something of Davite ritual thaumaturgy for a specific purpose, with the assumption that the priestess here was attempting to rewrite history. The Site-91 thaumatologists and historians came to a different conclusion, however, that the priestess merely intended to preserve their struggle for those of her culture to find afterwards. There was no retro-causal aspect to this anomaly merely an attempt to preserve a record of the conflict, and the intermingling of the Child of the Night's blood caused their memories to be preserved as well. In another entry from his private research log from November 30th, Lindqvist says that the Deva changed the way their entire civilization ended, multiple times, avoiding catastrophic losses and the results of revolution and sustained disastrous wars. All he wants to do is change one single event, one single day, and that shouldn't be so hard. After recovery, Lindqvist was put through a battery of psychological assessments due to the violent nature of his actions, with it being determined that continued handling of 8140 instances had a cumulative effect on his psyche, which further worsened the post-traumatic stress disorder from the death of his sister. The containment procedures had been adjusted accordingly to account for this cumulative side effect. After debriefing, Lindqvist was amnesticized and returned to work on 8140 under supervision. While amnestics can't remove the anomalous transfer of memories from the artifacts, they can erase events from Lindqvist's life. It was decided that in order to guarantee his ability to return to work, and with approval from the Ethics Committee, his memories leading up to his involvement with 8140 would be erased, including the loss of his sister. A cover story concerning her transfer to another facility under classified security has been implemented. So, Lindqvist suffered a terrible tragedy in which he lost his sister during a containment breach, and really struggled to deal with it. Things changed when he went back to work and was assigned an archaeology dig that ended up being connected to the Davites. Lindqvist was aware of the Davites in SCP-140, as in one of his earlier research logs he states that this could be what he's been waiting for. He believed that he had come across the perfect anomaly to bring back his sister, a Davite anomaly that showed him firsthand how to perform Davic thaumaturgy and rewrite history. His obsession and delusions were exacerbated by a previously unknown side effect of cumulative exposure to the memory-granting artifacts, leading to him attacking his own people. In the end, while the Davites do have magic capable of rewriting history, they also are largely interested in self-preservation in all of its forms, including memories. SCP-8140 was merely a historical record of this time and place, their battle against the Children of the Night, stored in the form of memories in various artifacts that were there. While they believed that SCP-8140 was rewriting Children of the Night history just like Davite history, as they had never found Children of the Night relics anywhere else, it was more just a twist of fate, 
that ended up with the Child of the Night's blood mingling in the ritual circle. In the end, Lindqvist lost the very thing that he was trying to undo, memories of his sister. While he might be happier, secure in the knowledge, to his own understanding, that his sister is alive and well in a classified facility, memories are an important part of who we are. The Davites, of course, understood that, and while it's almost certainly for the best that Lindqvist didn't find a way to rewrite history, it seems that the Foundation did their own little version of that. 